<laughs> Dude, alternative media, it's on, on the rise. And so uh, I'm interested in asking questions about like the intellectual property aspects of uh, your work. Oh uh, yeah, I haven't brought any of those up yet. Yeah, because a lot of people, of course, focus on the fact that it's creation of weapons. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think one of the the ideas that makes it so unique is that it's uh, something that's shared for everybody. You're not trying to profit off of it. Right. You're not trying to restrict it. Um, so if you could tell us, like, uh, I guess the the property, the intellectual property that you created, so to speak, you're not allowed to distribute at this point. Um, so can you just give like a background of what it is that's being restricted? That's the real problem, um, that there are these great regimes of intellectual property in biotech and electronics and armament which prevent really like not only the development but especially the publication or the cross, you know, kind of sharing of raw information related to the development of these technologies. And, uh, there's no exception in armament and the kind of irony is that we think that we have the right to keep and bear and to access and to make these weapons but the United States government has kind of covertly in the regulatory landscape crafted for itself an exclusive monopoly position which is intellectual property a kind of cold war IP regime which says all munitions developed in the United States by people that are United States citizens are our exclusive property and you must ask our permission first before you ever do anything with that information and there's subtle things in the gun community you can do to learn this when you go kind of look at like a magpul uh, grip or something like in, in the gun store, you'll see like, oh, this, this article is a defense article subject to blah 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 and some statutory scheme. Well, that's about the export control regime, which is a large IP regime. Um, what we're finding is a lot of companies in San Francisco are running to the same idea, even though they're not in armament, like Coursera and some of these other online educational projects. The problem is we have a Cold War legal superstructure, which is trying to kind of make sense of and provide gateways for the internet itself. Eight, nine bureaucrats, right? Trying to police billions of people sharing these certain files. We know that it's a kind of inevitably stupid endeavor, but like it's a very real thing that involves real power. And so there are people that are sharing your designs even though you're currently uh, not capable of hosting them publicly. That's right. I mean, we, we put our stuff out into the internet, served as many downloads as possible in the kind of 48 hours, especially after Liberator, that we were allowed to do it. Before that, we served millions of downloads, uh, well, over a million. And, um, and now it's left to the file sharing sites and those kind of brave cedars who have ideology, I guess. Do you know the risks that hang over the heads of people who are sharing the files? There are risks, but they are not great. Um, the State Department does consider some of, if, if you're to take what they call controlled information and to kind of rebroadcast the information, yeah, you're as equally guilty as I am of putting that into the public domain and not getting approval, doing something illegal. So there is a small risk to run, but again, it's this kind of like a fraction of like, you know, regulatory capability divided by a number of cedars, you know. There's a very small chance, one diminishing, you know, rapidly uh, that anything will come to you because of what you've done, seeding the files. Mm -hmm. And there haven't been anybody uh, charged or accused of having criminally shared no, files that's at right. this point? To date, there's been no, there's been no administrative action, no administrative progress on, on what we've done. So it's this, I mean, the cynical answer is that was kind of the point, to kind of squelch what we were doing while we were in our stride, while we were publishing files, getting money, putting things into the internet. Um, to use this process to kind of fill a gap that gun law and social probium couldn't kind of like prevent. Um, oh, we'll use foreign policy to stop them because nothing else will. Um, our kind of point is that there is no legal st structure or strategy or maze of regulations that can prevent the publication of these ideas and, and this information. Now, is it specifically the blueprints that one would plug into a 3D printer that are illegal, or if you were to write out a text, uh, just a, a text directions a of how to question. do it? It's a, it's a great legal question, and of course, the the facts of that are, I mean, that's a question that can only be answered by a, a judge or a court, right? There's certain legal authorities which, which say, like, well, pure information isn't speech the same way that, you know, like raw, like raw code isn't speech the same way that, like, a drawing is, or like a sentence is. Um, we're going to have to roughly legally analogize. Um, is a 3D printed STL file machine readable data that's just kind of code that a machine operates by? Or is it something kind of higher with an artistic level that has a kind of speech purpose or imminence, you know? These are metaphysical and legal questions that have yet to be determined. And uh, as somebody who releases work into the public domain directly, uh, is there any concern of yours that the information you're putting out there and the plans you're putting out there will just be patented by someone else with minor tweaks, in which case other people couldn't use them? Excellent question. Um, when we began Defense Distributed, uh, it was like, well, shit, if we just put some of this stuff out there uh, in the public domain, it'll just kind of be like reabsorbed by the Googles of the gun industry, and they'll be like, oh, it's our stuff now, stop sharing our stuff. Um, that was never so great a concern with receivers and magazines, uh, because those things are already based off of, let's say, open source or public domain information that's been out there a long time, Eugene Stoner's uh, AR-15 M16 designs. But when it came to the Liberator, that was such a, the calculus change, and our, and our real concern was, well, one strategy they can have is to just kind of play IP games with us, 
assert some kind of patent on it and then prevent us from sharing it. So we asserted the most minimal kind of license possible. Um, I think it was like a version of an MIT license. Uh, we said like, you know, attribution, don't change it without, you know, saying you changed it. Uh, and then we said something like copyright is theft, you know, <laughs> and, and then we put it out there. So we asserted some kind of copyright just in case someone wanted to play games. Um, because we, yeah, we, we were worried about that possibility. And uh, looking to the future, are you interested in trying to uh, pioneer or perfect 3D printed firearms, or do you feel that you've opened the door and you want to win more of uh, the intellectual property battle that's been uh, put out there? I don't know. There's so many fronts available to the digital libertarian, and you know, there's only so much time. So uh, I don't really feel a need to kind of oh, perfect an ideal you know, form of some of these guns, this technology. Uh, what we were doing was enough of a conversation in Firestarter, you know, that all that process, if it is one, will continue. Uh, I'm interested in new materials. I think there's still some things yet to do uh, with some of the new machines that are out, especially this year. Um, things I probably couldn't have even done a few months ago, but I think I'll be able to do in a couple months' time um, that are worth doing. Even if I can't publish the files, I can kind of create them and put them in video and kind of like, again, return the idea back to the system and instill the kind of same kind of fear that Jesus, events are on the march again, you know, <laughs> like revolution continues. Uh, that's still kind of worthy propaganda and something I, I might return to. And I guess it's inevitable at some point that a Liberator or a 3D firearm, a printed firearm, is going to be used in some sort of act of violence, whether it's defensive or offensive. Surely, surely. I think it's still kind of in the realm of uh, you know hobby and oddity and you know, trivia. Um, but at some point, someone's going to, much more likely it'll be like a pistol frame or receiver and a, and a rifle. They'll say, oh my god, they, you know, this crime is done with a ghost gun of a... Of a Printed gun, someone just put together in his basement. We had no idea, you know, and it will be used as whether it was intentional or whether it was kind of influenced by government agents. It will be used as an excuse to pass for the legislative like restrictions on what we're doing. Um, I'm sorry that I'm such an interested party that I'm so cynical. I think it will only go that way. I just think uh, that's the most likely story. But yeah, we have yet to see the kind of uh, the media reactions to violent events with 3D printed guns, but they're coming. Yeah. Do you have any other perspectives on like? Uh different ways of thinking about intellectual property because I know uh, I'm somebody who does a lot of media with video and and things get yanked off YouTube because oh you've used you know this copyrighted content or whatever I've, I've had up to two strikes before my account because I, I refuse to use open source music I just use the music that I think is you know, yeah which are big videos and everything so uh, in fact they took my liberator video down they got three million views and then Warner Chapel put in the claim with YouTube and they took it down. So it could have been this much bigger video, but because of copyright, it got, it got stuck, you know? There's, I guess Pirate Bay is the closest thing, but it isn't like there's one server out there where you know you can put something that's gonna be secure. Uh, well, it's like the Pirate Bay guy said, you know, like, why isn't there a competition for what we're doing, right? They coordinate an enormous amount of, of torrent traffic, and it's not, there's this great guy in Spain that launched torrents.com, uh, and so uh, there's great movement still in the space, but uh, the file sharing war is like, <laughs> need you, young man, you <laughs> go west. And, and yeah. go share files, you know? I, I think it is a form of activism, even if it's a kind of passive, uh, you know, lounge against the machine. Um, the crypto wars are back. The Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is, is going to kind of supplement some of these file sharing wars, and I think the IP structures are crumbling in a, in a recognizable way. I don't mean to say that it'll just kind of inevitably happen, that we'll just rid ourselves of it, but um, I don't know how to properly evangelize for it other than doing, you know? We're kind of past talking, it's just time to like wrote, do, and just kind of run right over these people and just like begin sharing the information. And uh, I guess one final point is, uh, I, I imagine encryption is an important part of keeping secret like a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, is there certain like encryption softwares or, or like tactics that you would encourage all people to engage in in order to uh, protect their information? Or? I'm actually, I'm deeply cynical about even the effectiveness of PGP. I still kind of do it as just a kind of ritual of security or something, you know? Like it just makes my conscience uh, a little bit better that at least I tried in some sense to hide what we were doing. Uh, but very often we don't hide what we're doing with PGP. Uh, early on we used Hushmail and for some essential things, uh, the Windows PGP, Win GPG or something. Um, but for a crypto anarchist, much less cryptography than you think, and much less crypto than you think. Uh, I just kind of naturally assume you have to be a bit ahead of them, and they'll catch you if they want. And I guess to, to some extent, since what you're doing is a public project, uh, we, publicity is actually a form of defense against some sort of government attack. For what we're doing, uh, crypto wasn't life or death, right? Like, we're not like Ross Ulbricht, we're not working directly in the shadows trying to completely be unknown or unseen. In this kind of ironic sense, we wanted to be seen, wanted to be known, and in that regard, like, I had to tell you what I was going to do before I did it. I didn't need to hide the message, I needed to broadcast it. Cryptography didn't play a large role in, in that kind of activism.